Rebecca is speaking next. And she's from FWAG, as many of you know, uh, giving you on-farm advice. And today, she's going to give you practical advice on how to make the, the most out of environmental schemes. So please welcome Rebecca. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think I'm on. OK. Um, we've heard a lot today about cover crops and legumes and herbal lays and depending on which barns you've been. So now I'm going to hopefully talk to you about how you can get paid to do some of these things under the environmental schemes and hopefully make you enthusiastic about um, the agri-environment schemes that are out there. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to start with who is FWAG? Um, for those of you who don't know, FWAG is an advisory body that's been giving independent advice to farmers for the last, well, over 45 years. Um, so it's the only thing we concentrate is, is giving good, sound, practical environmental advice to farmers so that they can fit it into their farm business. Um, we're made up of advisors, we are steered by farmers. We have working steering groups that are made up primarily by farmers, but also other partners um, and stakeholders that are interested in, in helping farmer, farmers deliver practical advice on farmland. Um, so they keep us grounded and well balanced about the advice that we deliver, the events that we do, um, the literature that we put out, um, whether it's going to be too long, too short, too wordy, uh, not wordy enough. Um, so they keep us fairly well grounded. And then we also uh, run probably the longest, most recognised uh, conservation award, the Silver Lapwing Award, um, which recognises the highest standards in, sort of in conservation. Um, and that is the whole farmed environment, that's soils as well as habitats, um, engagement with public, um, so the whole sort of gambit, really, um, that it recognises. And uh, we are pretty much nationwide. Um, we run in the majority of counties, right up through the Midlands, um, Scotland. Um, so you're never very far away from a flag advisor. We've taught, I've heard a lot today about knowledge exchange and the research and that there's not enough research or the research doesn't get down to farmers. That's one of our major roles is knowledge transfer. Um, trying to get the research filtering down to a practical farm level. Um, so we bring farmers together. We run a membership and we try and bring farmers together um, to look at different practices, best practices in conservation, um, new techniques, getting farmers together to look at how farmers have done it well, how they've done it not so well, the problems that they have. So it's all about just getting together and working together. Um, at all times of year, as you can see, this one is looking at um, getting rather a monster hedge chipper um, following some coppicing work. All our advisors, all FWAG advisors, have to be a minimum basis conservation train. So we're the only organisation that has a baseline that its advisors have to adhere to. Um, and we have to be a member of a professional body so that we're continually ourselves doing CPD um, and keeping up to date with everything. So that's really important to us. Um, and the FWAG Association um, also engages with GWCT very closely because of their Allerton project and their farmland research that they do and LEAF. So they're the three farmer-facing organisations that, uh, well, we are the, th the three farmer-facing organisations that help to deliver advice to you as farmers in hopefully the most practical way um, that can fit into your farm business. And this is the most important point, I think, that we try and help farmers to deliver practical conservation for their farm, that it fits in with their farm business. It doesn't matter what the neighbours are doing, it's about your farm and what works there. Um, so it's just trying to dovetail it in because it's not an either or, it's about integrating the two um, and working hand in hand, conservation and farming. Farm management, agricultural management is not just about 
uh, working with crops, it's about working with the conservation as well to get the best results. We also hopefully deliver um, practical guides. We do something that's very popular. It's, it's a bespoke sort of manual. It helps people look at conservation work on their farm. It tends to be around agri-environment schemes to help you manage agri-environment schemes because they can be quite complicated in all the different things you have to do on farm. Um, so we just bespoke sort of guides to help you, contractors, people on the farm, know what's going on in each field. Um, so we do bespoke maps, calendars, um, practical guides about what's going on in that field so people hopefully don't go in and plough up the wrong bits, take out the wrong bits or do the wrong bit of management. Um, so everything we try and deliver is to help farmers work with the conservation on the farm and try and get it right. So we've also been around a long time in that we've seen the change in agri-environment schemes. We've been there through the evolution of agri-environment schemes. Some of us have been advisors for longer than we care to remember. Um, and we've seen this change in the different roles of agri-environment schemes. My role as an advisor, I started off um, working on farms. Subsequently then went to agricultural college and then became as interested in the whole farmed environment as I was in growing crops and beef and sheep and milking cows and all the rest of it. So I then went and did an ecology degree and now put the two together. Um, and working on a landscape scale, this is the changing face of, um, of agri-environment schemes. We're moving more onto sort of the landscape scale approach Primarily because most species are very mobile. Um, as you know, birds, pollinators, all these species are very mobile. And so doing things in isolation isn't the best way forward. So this is about working on a landscape scale. You may have heard about facilitation funds. Farmer clusters is the new sort of buzzword. Um, so it's looking at the wider farmed environment, not just your own farms. And that's an approach I think government is going to take going forward. It's something that we're doing now, um, and it's something I think we'll see written more into agri-environment going forwards. Collaborative working, whether it's on a catchment scale or whether it's on sort of habitats, um, so it'll vary, and it depends on the focus of your area, but it'll be able to, you'll be able to work collectively together for particular objectives. So... I'm going to talk a little bit about countryside stewardship, but I'm not going to drill down in it too much. Um, there's 146 countryside stewardship options, of which 64 are capital items. So if I stood here and just went through each and every one, I'm sure you'd all, given that it's quite a warm barn, just drift off to sleep slowly. So I'm just going to run through a little bit of detail about countryside stewardship. And, uh, and the nuts and bolts, and then just talk generally about the sort of habitats that we're looking to create and work it into some of the stuff that I've heard today as well. So, as you can see, it's split into several elements. We've got mid-tier, higher-tier, and standalone capital grant schemes. Um, the mid-tier is the scheme that you would imagine the majority of people would be looking to go into um, Multi-objectives, so there's lots of different objectives, which I'll go into in a minute. The hope is there's a widespread uptake, that it's open to all. Um, there are simpler management options within it. And it's five years, um, it's a five-year scheme, similar to ELS was. We've got then higher tier, which is similar to the old high-level scheme. That's, again, multi-objective, but it's site-specific. There's more tailored action. action. So the, the idea is, is that you're likely to have quite a specific habitat, um, whether it's a scheduled monument, a site of special scientific interest, or something pretty interesting that you would already know about that might require some specific management and some specific help in managing those habitats. So higher level, is, higher tier, sorry, is focused on those particular farms. The expectation is the majority of people will be looking at mid-tier. 
Now, the, the benefit of mid-tier is that you decide what options go where, how much of it you want to do, and where you want to do it. And then there are capital grants for single objective schemes. So there's two years of so the hedgerow and boundary grant, and there are capital grants for in water priority areas. Introduced last year to simplify it a little bit, because I think there was some concern, Michael Gove thought there was some concern about farmers in looking to do applications within mid-tier and there was no guarantee to get in because it is now a competitive scheme. ELS, you got your points, you were guaranteed entry into the scheme. Countryside stewardship is competitive. Um, so you're looking to score maximum points to enable you to get into the scheme. So the simplified scheme takes that competitive nature out of it. Um, if you meet certain objectives of the scheme, then you are guaranteed entry. Um, but it's simplified because you've got a limited selection of options. I'm just going to show you um, the arable version, but it's been split into a simplified arable mid-tier scheme, a mixed farming one, a lowland grazing one, or an upland one. Um, so depending on your farm, where you farm, and the type of farm that you have, would depend on what you would opt for here. So as you can see, there's a limited list of options, and you have to choose one, of the, one from each of your categories. So here we've got category one. Your only choice is you have to do, for every 100 hectares of land that you've got, one hectare of one of those options, a pollen nectar mix or a flower-rich plot. So that's one of your categories. Category two, you've only got one option to choose from, and that's winter bird food. And you have to have a minimum of two hectares per 100 hectares of your farm. And then we've got a little suite of options down here, and you have to choose one thing from that third category. Um, and there's no minimum, there's no maximum, but you can just choose a buffer strip, some hedgerow management, skylark plots, a bit of supplementary feeding for the birds. <coughs> and if you do that, you're guaranteed entry into the scheme. So it's simplified because you're restricted with the, the list of options that you've got. Um, so you've got minimum areas. You've got no maximums, but you've got minimums. So that's essentially the, the sort of stewardship schemes. And then within the main mid-tier, you've got a whole suite of options. What people tend to find slightly overwhelming about countryside stewardship is this. And it's not available in paper form. It's only available online. But don't let this put you off. Whilst it looks quite a lot of information, most of those options won't be relevant to you on your farm. But it just shows you what you've got to choose from um, to make it work for you. Within the scheme, you've got objectives. And so there's targeting to help you choose the right option in the right place. Okay, if you're not sure where to put things or where they might work best, the idea is, is you've got targeting and targeting statements based on natural character areas, which is essentially based on the soil that you farm. Um, and that will dictate the wildlife and the habitats that live in your surrounds. So here we've got just targeting for, as you can see, I've picked it off Magic, which is a great online tool. If you've never looked at Magic, it's worth having a look at. Um, and uh, it's magic.gov.uk and you've got a drop down layer whoop I don't know what I've done there sorry so we've got a drop down layer here countryside stewardship targeting and scoring layers so you can drop that down and you can look at all the different um, objectives for your area so here we are at Lanark Farm, just off the A1, and we're looking at water priorities, and you can see it's all gone red. And so here we are in a priority water catchment um, for surface water nitrates and sediment and phosphate issues. So those are the priorities here. So it's looking for you to hopefully deliver um, options 
that will help to alleviate those issues. It could be buffer strips, it could be a whole range of um, options, which I'll talk about um, a little further on. But there are all sorts of layers in there that you can look at. You can look at farm wildlife, farmland birds, <coughs> landscape, what are the objectives for your area, um, what river catchment you're in. So there's all sorts of things you can, you can get lost in this website and have a look at all sorts of information. It's, um, it's, it's pretty interesting. And it just helps to, for you to see what would score highly if you put in an application. Um, what's a high priority, what's a medium priority, what's a low priority, which is all laid out in targeting statements. So it's all there really to help and guide you um, into how to do uh, a good mid-tier application. So a lot of what we're all here over the, the next couple of days about is about building resilience into the farmed environment, um, looking at the future and uh, how to protect soils, build wildlife habitats, linking habitats, growing better crops, growing healthier crops. There's a whole range of things to deliver within the farmed landscape. You're all under enormous pressure to deliver all sorts of objectives on behalf of the rest of us. Um, leisure, recreation, energy, everything. It's all out there. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of the options. So we're going to look at pollinators, natural predators. It seems sort of the right thing to talk about when we've been talking about all these herbal lays and legume crops and um, clovers. And, and then looking at linking habitats, soil health and water, and just general farm wildlife, which fits into all the things that we've been sort of talking about through the day other people. Now this is something that is probably sort of quite familiar habitat to most people, the sort of lovely nectar flower rich clover and vetches. Um, this is something that we've, that's been talked about by a lot of the other speakers um, as something that they think this is going to be one of the sort of future opportunities for people to grow clover and vetches, to build soil fertility, to put organic matter back into the soil. But under the agri-environment schemes, you can be paid to do this. So you can sort of, you can, you can use those objectives to deliver a whole load of other objectives as well, because the wildlife benefits of these are huge. Um, but they don't work everywhere, and you don't always get the picture postcard look that we've got up there. They do come with their problems, um, depending on your soil type and what was there before and what's sitting in the seed bank waiting to come up. Um, so this pollen and nectar mix is, is obviously delivering a huge amount for pollinators and pollinators on our behalf, all of our behalf, of a del obviously deliver um, massive benefits in the pollination process. So pollen and nectar mixes are not the only way to deliver those objectives. Um, designing habitats is all about what fits on your farm and also what interests you as well on your farm. Um, what you want to see yourselves. So here we've got um, a more permanent mix. So the pollen and nectar mix is something that you would sow that would last maybe three, maybe four years and it might then need um, either tickling up with some more seed or starting again depending on what condition it's in, what soil type you're on. Obviously, on your, if you're on the light land, they do better. <coughs> if you're on heavy, heavy ground, you might get thistles and docks coming in and you might just want to then tidy that up a bit. And these options within the agri-environment schemes are rotational. This one isn't, but the pollen nectar is. So don't feel that once you've put it down, you're tied to that area forever. You can move these options around um, and try something else in a different area. This is more of a, of a grass wildflower mix. So this is more permanent. This is something that you want to get the management right. Um, and hopefully, it will be there for a very long time if you manage it right. Where you've got a lot of residual nitrogen, this will go in the first couple of years. But it will slowly, slowly calm down. And if you can cut that and remove it, then all the better. 
um, because you're taking away that mulch, you're taking away the nutrients that would be going back into the soil, um, and you're leaving it nice and sort of clean for, for the next spring flush. If you leave that material on the ground and it does sort of mulch, then you can get things like thistles and docks coming through, which is not really what you want. Um, so these provide a bit more than your pollen nectar because they've got grasses in, you're going to be providing sort of nesting habitat for your um, pollinators as well. This, is, this has sort of got a, a more longevity in it in terms of its flowering period as well. If you choose the right flowers within these mixes, they'll be flowering earlier, middle of the year, and then through to the late summer. So you get longer flowering periods in these sort of, it's a lowland meadow effect really, this one. So increasingly the evidence points to um, the reduction of productivity at the field edge. Um, and we've not really had the research to, to show it up until now, um, but research done by Centre of Ecology and Hydrology um, at, and the Farming Wildlife Company have shown under a project called the Hillsdon Project that there is... Um, more or less a sort of 20% reduction at the headland, um, sort of nine metres in. And uh, if you took those areas out, um, if you're looking at sort of three to eight percent of the land out, that you won't see a reduction in, in yield across the field by taking those areas out and giving them to wildlife. Um, and in fact, with beans, you will see an increase in production because if you're creating wildflower areas around there, you're increasing obviously the pollinator habitat and they have an opportunity to work harder for you within beans um, and you will see a benefit in your crops um, but you will see no reduction in productivity if you're growing something like wheat or rollseed rape by taking out your sort of headland areas and your awkward field corners they will actually be working for you um, and there is now um, the evidence to show that under this research that's been uh, led by Richard Pywell of CEH. And this is what you can do. So this is looking at exactly that. So here we've got, it may not necessarily be an unproductive corner, but it's an awkward corner. And it means that you might be double dosing it, whether it's fertilizers or sprays, um, which is obviously costly and not great for the environment. So you can use agri-environment schemes to take these areas out um, and provide really good wildlife habitat. So I think the sort of new buzzword is ecological intensification. So we've seen sort of agricultural intensification and now you can start to um, drive ecological intensification as farmers. So you've got, you're growing good crops here, but you're also growing really good wildlife habitat. And it's really delivering um, because it's providing multiple benefits for a lot of different species. So pollinators we're looking at, everybody talks about sort of bumblebees. Solitary bees are our best friends in terms of pollination. Um, and then we've got honeybees and we've got all sorts of other insects that will help pollinate the crops. But it's not just pollinators, it's obviously, we're trying to build up the reservoir of natural predators as well. So you've got your crop pest, pest that you're battling against and these areas will be helping you to build up a natural reservoir of predators. Things like carabid beetles, um, ladybird larvae, lacewings, and hoverfly larvae, all sorts of um, insects out there that are actually um, eating away, whether it's slugs or um, aphids, all sorts of things. Um, so providing these habitats is, I would say, an essential part of the farmed landscape. Um, and within these schemes, you can get paid to do it. So something like a pollen and nectar mix will pay you 511 pounds a hectare to do it. Um, and then the floristically enhanced plots and margins, which is a rather long-winded name, but these more permanent strips um, pay you a little bit more. 
But don't feel bad if you haven't got flowers in something. Don't let anybody rubbish your grass margins because they are still really good habitats. Um, if you imagine there's a wildflower margin, the idea is you need to cut it each year. Ideally collect it, but you're cutting it so that you're restricting the grass growth and you're allowing the flowers to come up and flourish. And that's fantastic for, for um, all your pollinators. Um, but it's not great for anything that wants to overwinter because we've decimated that habitat sort of in the late autumn. So you want to have a whole range of other things in the, in the farm landscape that supports those things for different times of years. If you think uh, uh, if you're a bee, you're basically looking for food, shelter, and a mate. Those are the three things you really want, um, a nesting habitat. So these grass margins are fantastic for that. They're also great for things like barn owls. Um, barn owls love the thatch at the bottom of a grass margin. Um, that's where all the voles will be running around and living in those areas. So you'll get that with a grass margin because you're only going to really be cutting each year the outside three metres, and then you leave that until the hedge starts creeping in. When you start seeing blackthorn and things creeping, then you give that a bit of a haircut. But otherwise, it's building up this lovely dead grass thatch, which barn owls just will love hunting again. So you want to mix it up a bit. You don't want all flower-rich margins. You want a lot, but you don't want them all to be that. Um, so grass margins are good. Um, they're just not very sexy, but they do provide an awful lot of um, benefits. And there'll be a lot of overwintering going on in there. So caribou beetles, um, you'll get mammals in there, you'll get bumblebees nesting in the banks, overwintering, you'll get all sorts of things going on in there. You just don't see a lot of it. Um, it's all about connectivity as well. It's all about linking everything up. Um, so most species would not like to travel across an open field. Whether they're a beetle, a bumblebee, a bat, whatever they are, they like using linear habitats. They're safe and they're flyways. Um, so it's about linking up, whether it's woodlands to hedges, hedges to pollen nectar mixes, to wild bird seed mixes. It's, it's just linking it all up and just looking at your farm and just trying to plan it. You very rarely can put something in the wrong place. Um, but you just need to be able to sort of link it all up. And you'll soon know when it's in the wrong place because it won't grow. So then the following year, you just pick it up and you put it somewhere else. So it's about using these corridors. Most species that fly, insects particularly, don't like gaps in hedges. I'm not saying go and plant every single gap, but they don't really like gaps. They like to just keep on going down. They won't fly over the hedge most things. They'll just keep flying to the end and then they'll just keep flying along and around. So linear habitats are fantastic, um, and hedgerows are probably one of our most underestimated habitats because they're the single biggest habitat that we have on farmland. Um, and we could look after them a little bit better. So here you can see that you've got um, a hedgerow that hasn't been cut for three years and a hedgerow that has been cut annually and you can see the amazing difference in flowering of that hedge. Um, there's a, a five-fold increase in the flower production of that hedge because we haven't cut it. Now not every hedge is appropriate for cutting on a one year in three rotation. This is a hawthorn hedge so it can take it. If you've got a lot of ash in your hedge or a lot of elm, field maple, it grows big and it's a, it's a job for the flail to, um, to manage it. So under countryside stewardship, you can also get paid <coughs> to manage your hedges a little bit more sympathetically. One year in three hedgerow management payment um, to just encourage this additional flower production. This is an important time for particularly bumblebees. They've come out from the cold winter, they're looking for food to build their nests, to give them energy. And there aren't many flowers on the ground around for them, and the hedges are really, really important um, to provide them with that, with that food stock. And so Countryside Stewardship <coughs> mid-tier is looking to support you in all the different sort of farm management that you might want to do. 
um, to help you look after all the different types of habitats that you might have on your farm. So you can get paid. Um, you don't have to put all your hedges in. You can just select a few that you think can cope with a one year in three management option. Um, and you can leave the rest of them out. You don't have to put all of them in by any means. There's other options now. Um, we can see um, this new great tool, the tree shears, that will help farmers coppice hedges. It's no more a case of two people having to go out with a chainsaw on a, on a cold day. Um, it's now sitting in the cab, letting the machine do the work. This piece of kit can do about 400 metres a day. And so you can allow your hedges to start to grow up. Um, it's not... Um, it's always been an issue that if you allow your hedges to grow up, then what do you do with them? Then you've got to coppice them. You've somehow got to manage them. Well, this gives us the greater ability to manage those hedges um, and coppice them back down to the floor again, as you can see has been done here, so that they can regrow, thicken up from the base um, and become a nice thick habitat again and start over again. And this is a cycle historically that would have been done on a lot of farms but there's also payment rates within countryside stewardship to do it. Hedgerow coppicing, hedgerow laying, um, anything you can think of to do with hedgerows, if you're in Cornwall, Cornish, Banks. Um, so there's management for all these boundary features um, that you can, uh, you can apply for grants for. So it's giving you the tool, the financial ability to, to do it, and you can get four pounds a metre for coppicing a hedge. Um, and... Some hedges you might even make a bit of money on because these things can, can really rock it through, particularly a hedge that sort of size. Ooh. So hedges in particular deliver a huge amount in terms of biodiversity um, and objective. So we've got early pollination. So there we've got the pussy willow. We've got habitat for dormice. Um, which there was a headline this morning, are on the brink of extinction if we don't start to look after and manage our habitats better. Um, bats, a great flyway for bats for echolocating. Nesting birds, fruit for both us and the wildlife. And um, banks for, for wildflowers. So all of these species will benefit from the more sympathetic management. And then there's the benefits to us, wood fuel. You can use it in your wood chippers and stock proofing, soil protection, and leisure. Um, so they deliver an awful lot. Um, so it's one thing that I think we, we tend to ignore within countryside stewardship, but I think embrace hedgerow management and get paid to help you do it. Um, that's the key thing. One of the things that we're also involved in as FWAG is we... We represent farmers on various sort of groups. And so we try and not only bring information down to you, research information, we take information back up to people like Natural England and DEFRA and LEAF and people like that and say how it's working for you on the ground and what's not working. And then hopefully we can affect change, which we, which we usually do. Um, so one of the things we sit on is a group called Hedgelink, which is looking at the management of hedgerows across the, across the farm landscape and influence options within countryside stewardship. We also sit on the countryside stewardship agricultural stakeholder group. So when things aren't working within countryside stewardship, we can feed that back up and Natural England do their best to make changes as quickly as they can. So further linking of habitats. This picture is not a million miles away from here um, on the chalk, but it's about linking. You've got linking woodlands up with hedgerows. You've got an area of almost pure chalk, which is why this cultivated margin works so well, um, because this is very, very light ground. Um, and as you can see, there's an awful lot of diversity in there, um, a lot of rare arable plants in that particular habitat another option that's paid under this scheme. So if you're on light land, why go to necessarily the expense of sowing a grass mix or a wildflower mix when it's all there sitting in the seed bank waiting to come up? Um, 
you can just cultivate that area in the autumn or the spring and just see what comes up. And it can be rotated. If you don't get what you want to come up and you think it's not working terribly well there, you can try it somewhere else. So this one works pretty well. Um, but it works well partly because it's in a sheltered spot as well. Most insects don't like windy spots, so you can put them in an area, but if it's not sheltered <coughs> and it's windy, you won't see much activity there on that particular day. Um, so try and look for connecting places up. Linear habitats are better than if you're just going to do small, discrete blocks, but you just have to do what's going to fit and what's going to work. Um, but all these options can be funded within countryside stewardship. Grassland options. Um, we've heard a lot about herbal lays. This is obviously not a picture of a herbal lay, but um, herbal lays is something that can be funded under countryside stewardship. So if that's something after these two days that you think you're going to go home and give it a go, then and you're looking at countryside stewardship, then you can put the two together. You can have a go at herbal lays and you can get funded to do it at the same time. So it's using countryside stewardship to work for you as much as natural England getting you to work for, for the wildlife. So you've got to make the two work together. If it doesn't work for you, it won't work very well. Um, so if you've got particularly nice grassland, um, we've got some new options that were brought down into countryside stewardship from the higher tier, more specialist uh, management options. So managing species-rich grassland. So if you've got nice grassland that looks a little bit like this, there is an option within countryside stewardship now that's a better paid option that you can use um, to help you manage um, these areas because quite often they're not particularly big areas. Um, so it gives you the financial ability to perhaps manage it um, sympathetically. Other farm wildlife. Um, the two main drivers within countryside stewardship are pollinators and farmland birds because they're the ones that we see hitting the headlines all the, all the time. The declines in farmland birds and the declines in pollinators. Um, pollinators, the declines in pollinators is critical because obviously they're hugely important to us globally, um, but individually um, they're very, very important as well. And so we need to be doing everything we can to increase the levels of pollination and pollinators on farmland um, because we have 70 plus percent of our, of our island that's farmed, um, then it's down to you guys to deliver an awful lot of that. Farm, farmland birds, so this is the wildlife, uh, the wild bird seed option, another option that's available under countryside stewardship. So this is sowing a mixture of different seeds, um, specifically for farmland birds. <coughs> but there will be other benefits. Small mammals will use these areas. Um, if you throw in some other things like phacelia and a bit of borage, you can, uh, you'll be benefiting pollinators uh, in the summertime, and then you'll get the nice seed crop in the wintertime. So this is an option that's now gone from £450 a hectare in entry-level scheme to £640 a hectare in countryside stewardship. So there's nearly £200 a hectare jump in the payment rate of this particular option. This is something we don't really want to see on any farms. Um, so one of the objectives of countryside stewardship is resource protection, so keeping the soil in the field. Here we've got a nice sloping field, water collecting at the bottom, running along, straight into the ditch, and you can't see it very well there, but I can tell you the water's nice and brown. Um, so that's your soil coming out of your field. Um, so it's about keeping it in the field, and so that's a, a prime example of where could you put a countryside stewardship option. You could put minimum of a six metre margin along there, you could put a 12 to 24 metre margin along there, or you could put a wider block of um, grass along there to protect um, that habitat at the bottom and protect the water quality. So this is something that 
you need to look at and recognise on all of the farms and see what you can do to stop these events happening. Even if that's a one year in five event, it still shouldn't happen. Um, you still need to be looking to make your farm resilient for the future. The future weather patterns <coughs> particularly. So it's about protecting all these habitats. And use countryside stewardship. It's a, it's a very flexible scheme. Administratively, it's a bit tricky. But in terms of the options, um, they're pretty flexible. You can use the scheme to help diversify the cropping, make a mosaic out of what you've got. Here we've got a nice black grass um, problem in this field. You can use countryside stewardship to help you in as one of your management tools to help combat and reduce the effects of black grass. One of the options that someone was talking about this morning was these sort of ryegrass clover lays. That's an option in countryside stewardship pays you over 500 pounds a hectare to do it. As good as if you were going to sow something like beans. Um, you put it down for a couple of years. You just have to top it. You're not looking to make silage out of it or graze it. Um, you're just looking to manage the black grass on those particular areas. Um, there's no minimum area. There's no maximum area. There's just very simple prescriptions of management that you can use. And it's just... One of the tools in the box you can use on some of your fields to help combat a problem that you might have in amongst all the other options that you can use within the scheme. So, quoting from, well, nearly quoting from Field of Dreams, not quite, but to get your Field of Dreams, to get your intensively farmed cropped area and your ecological intensification, if you create these habitats, the species will come. They will find you, and they will utilize these areas, and they will hugely benefit from it, and so will the farm business. It makes you resilient for the future. It's now shown that it will boost the income of the farm um, by providing these habitats, and countryside stewardship will fund a lot of these options and help you through it. But I think the one thing I would say is get advice. Talk to somebody about it. Talk to somebody who's not just a form filler, but someone who's got the experience who can take you out and look at what you can do and where you can do it and help you through the five years or the ten years that you might be doing it. That They don't disappear, that they're there to hold your hand throughout the process. Because growing flowers isn't easy, it's, uh, it's a tricky process, um, but with the right advice, uh, you will be able to succeed, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know it's boiling hot and everything. It's and really it's hot. Difficult. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was fascinating. Um, I expect you've got questions about that, about your... Yeah. Here we go. If you, and the next person, if they put up their hand, I can know where to go after that. Hi. Um, you didn't mention the legume and herb rich sward EK21 option as an arable whole field option. Um, in, are there any restrictions on the use of that in terms of when you could graze it or take a hay cut up or something like that? There are. I mean, there are sort of within the scheme, there are prescriptions for each option. Um, but the idea of grazing options is that they're there to fit in with a farm business. They're not looking to restrict you hugely. I mean, with, it, with certain things, there are cutting dates. I mean, the, I've got the manual here, and I could, you know, I could read out the particular prescriptions, but they are there really to help you forage um, and utilise that. And then, obviously, the wildlife benefits come because you've got flowers and, and things within it. But the idea of this scheme is there is a lot of flexibility within the management of it. Um, resting periods just so things can flower but you will have a very wide sort of broad uh, period of when you when you can cut and you just have to rest within that period for a certain number of weeks so the idea is that the, they're almost they want to say you know this is what we want you to grow you're the farmers you know how to grow things we're just giving you a few do's and don'ts and there aren't very many the reason this is so fat 
is because it's trying to put advice in there as well. It's not just the prescriptions, but it's trying to help you choose species and how to manage certain things. So it's an advisory booklet as well as um, a prescriptive booklet. Yeah. There is that much, yeah, there is a lot of flexibility in it, yeah. Hi, C um, can I ask, if you've got successful sort of floristically enhanced grass field corners, I mean field corners in an arable situation, um, are you allowed to carry them through to a new scheme or do you have to re-establish them, so to speak? So they've already got flowers in them. Yeah. Yeah, no, you can just carry those through. Right. Um, so you don't have right. to start again with anything. You, If you've already got it, and it broadly sort of fits the bill, then yeah, you just take it through. Okay. And I mean, I think that would be the case now. Whatever you do now, if it's for pollinators or farm, farmland birds particularly, that'll be the emphasis going forwards. Thank you. And then, and then secondly, please, um, you're talking about prescriptions that are helpful for black grass. Is there some way you can use, I think it's a lapwing plot uh, in localized black grass areas? In theory, you could, but you, you've got to be, there's prescriptions about where you can site them, so it may not fit with where your black grass, black grass is, because you can't put them near woods and electricity lines. Um, so there are, there are sort of restrictions on where you can place those. So you might find your black grass is in one place and your lapwing plot has to go somewhere else. Hi. Um, there are issues when you're establishing a cover crop or a, a sort of a winter bird feeding, in some circumstances, you might like to do some remedial work at the same time, i.e. mould ploughing. Is it possible to mould plough through an establishing wild flower or uh, wild bird mix? It is possible. I mean, ideally, you, you know, you've done it before you've established the yeah, area. But yes, I mean, so long as you're... I mean, it's harder when you've got something like a beetle bank in the middle of a field, obviously, um, and margins, but so long as you, if it's grass sort of margins, so long as you rectify, you know, what you've done, because you can use your grass strips to manage your hedgerows, so it can give you access to cut hedgerows later. Um, but you may do a little bit of damage to those areas, depending on the weather and where you are. Um, so, so long as you sort of rectify that damage, um, then it's fine. Well, thank you very thank much you. indeed, Rebecca. <laughs> that was a great... <laughs> <laughs> so, so what? I can't really remember what they were.